that all still going on backstage, but we have to move on. In the eight and a half years since Lenny Bruce's death, there have been dozens of books, albums, articles, and family arguments about him. Certainly the best known movie is the recent film with Dustin Hoffman and Valerie Perrine. It's a great movie with fine acting, but it's still not the real thing. But there is a film around with some very exciting footage of Lenny Bruce actually performing and talking and just being himself. It's made by writer-producer Fred Baker, who knew Lenny Bruce, and while so many others have tried to exploit the Bruce legend, Baker and his wife have worked hard to make an honest film. It's called Lenny Bruce Without Tears, a documentary of a friend. Take a look at a segment of it. Lenny didn't belong on television. He made it on college campuses and jazz joints. He was a stand-up comic who needed freedom. And in the early 60s, he thought he'd found that in places like the Red Hill in New Jersey, the Jazz Workshop, the Hungry Eye on the Coast, and the Cafe Ogogo in the city. And in fact, he had. Married to Honey Harlow, his ideal goyish chick, Lenny was snapping and bouncing his way through a life of one-liners. Honey bore him a girl child named Kitty. Lenny was happy. But when he and Honey weren't happy, they used drugs mostly speed. And what it did was to make his comedy run a little ahead of his time. <laughs> Will Elizabeth Taylor become bar mitzvahed? <laughs> I promise continuity, I'll behave myself. I'll do all the lines that we rehearsed, you know. That's the thing, you know. I have a, a reputation for being sort of controversial and irreverent and also the semantic bear trap of bad taste. And actually, I do have, and I will always be accused of bad taste by the people who eat in restaurants to reserve service, you know, that kind of scene to anyone, yeah. But you might be interested in how I became offensive. <laughs> I, like, started in school with, um, uh, drinking, and, uh, I was, really, I was like a real depressed kid, and, you know, seven, eight years old, and I'd really get juiced and get out of my life. And, uh, so the teacher would really get bugged, you know, with, with me singing and carrying on, you know, and calling Columbus a fink, and, uh, and, and boosting Aaron Burr, and all this. One guy on the coast who's got like a nutty sense of humor, you know. His name is Paul Coates, and he found out, dig, like there were kids that eight and nine years old that were sniffing airplane glue. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, to get high on, you know, and uh, so I had sort of a fantasy how it happened. The kid is alone in his room, and it's Saturday. The child is played by George McCready. <laughs> Well, let's see now, I'm all alone in the room and it's Saturday. Mother's away and what'll I do that's good and hostile? Uh, let's see, I'll, uh, I'll make an airplane, that's good. I'll make a Lancaster, good structural design. I'll get the ball to it, I'll sand it here. I'll cut that off, I'll get the struts now. Now I'll get a little airplane glue, I'll rub it on the rag and, uh, ah. <laughs> Hey, now, it's another plane here. Yeah. I'm getting loaded. Is this possible loaded on airplane glue? Maybe it's just stuffy in here. I'll call my dog over. Flicker. <laughs> Flicker, come here, darling, and smell this rat. Smell it, you freaky little doggy. <laughs> smell that rat, right, Flicker. Flicker. Flicker! <laughs> it worked. I'm the Louis Pasteur of junkiedom. <laughs> I'm out of my skull for tinnitus. Well, there's much work to be done now. Horses' hooves to melt down. Noses to get ready. Cut to the toy store. Any toy store, any hobby shop. Might be your kid who walked in that day. ding a ling a ling a ling Hello, Mrs. Schindler. Nice store you got here. Uh, give me a nickel's worth of pencils and a big boy tablet and some erasers and 2,000 tubes of airplane glue. <laughs> Lenny's first bust was in the city of brotherly love. It was a drug charge without a chance of sticking. He won the case, and years later, the trial judge was dismissed from the bench. 
But what really happened, what really went down in Philadelphia was that Lenny Bruce had been identified as sick. In two years, he was arrested a half a dozen times across the country and banned in London and Australia. Still, Lenny believed in the courts, believed he would be vindicated. Lenny had become a target. Wherever he appeared, police, peace officers, he called them, sat up front in San Francisco, in Chicago, in Los Angeles. They'd listen to his bit, bust him, and then they'd do his act in court badly. There was community pressure uh, and there was public pressure uh, in the sense that the overwhelming percentage of the population, middle America, the silent majority, wanted Lenny Bruce prosecuted and they wanted him punished uh, because his words were offensive and because his ideas uh, hurt the establishment and uh, wounded the establishment. He said things uh, that the establishment didn't want said. And for that reason, uh, I feel that uh, uh, there, was a, there was a compulsion uh, to, to prosecute him and to punish him. And we did. He, he, didn't, he didn't harm anybody. He didn't commit an assault. He didn't steal. Uh, he didn't engage in any conduct which directly harmed someone else. Uh, so therefore, uh, he was punished first and foremost because uh, of the words that he used. Well, you're, you're saying you feel that now. At the time, how did you feel? Well, at the time, I, I was given a job to do. I was wrapped up in the prosecution of it. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, I was oblivious of, of uh, some of the things that, that we were doing uh, to him personally. Would you do it now? No, no. Why, the, why in the last year or so has the pressure been increased against you. The, 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 the I know, but stop it. <laughs> I hate it. It's chic to arrest me. Why does it suddenly accelerate? Because I've gotten a little, um, I'm not restricting myself as much as I used to. Yeah. But other cops, aside from the ones who bust you, uh, constitute some of your best audience? Or so I oh, yes. Right. Peace officers. Uh, anyone who's been exposed to, uh, you know, a lot of life, as be so sorry. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, they think I'm quite humorous in a wagon. I'm very... <laughs> Are you trying to convert when you work? Oh, no, not at all. I'm trying to make a buck. I'd grab it. No. Oh, uh, uh, terrible of you. <laughs> but not, that's not my motivation being up there. What is? I can't have fun. Yeah. I really dig being up there. In what, I mean, what is the, the particular kick? The fact that you can say this and they'll listen? No. It, or just the, just the fact that you're It's fun to say a poem in front of everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just fun to get up and, and everybody listens to you and your mother and father listen to you. Just they finally listen to you and they don't chase you out of the room. So I did. Did you ever hear me dance? No. Oh, I'll show, I'll show my dance. I have to... Uh, I'm going to take this off for a moment to do the dance, that's all, and then I'll put it back on again. It's the first time I've ever danced before an audience. It's my, uh, it's my American folk dance. <laughs> all right, uh, am I in good enough? Can you get the body off me? All right. <laughs> in a sense, an evangelist on a street corner. He was a man uptight against an artificial world who shattered its facades and its hypocrisy. And if you will pardon the the phrase which seems to have become a cliché. He saw life as it is. 
Lenny Bruce. It's a great film. Yeah. Lenny Bruce once said, I'm not a comedian and I'm not sick. The world is sick and I'm the doctor. I'm a surgeon with a scalpel for false values. I don't have an act, I just talk. I'm just Lenny Bruce. When we come back, we'll be talking with Kitty, his real life daughter. That's in a few minutes right after this.